welcome to Go on the Run and today we're going to look at Go Template. Okay, so what are Go Templates? Well, Go Templates is a way for you to combine static text and data to create dynamic text. Now that might make a lot of sense, but let's, let's do this. Let's start with our code that we wrote the last time for server push event, but we're not really going to use all of the code. So let's, we have to start somewhere. So let's do that. And since we start with that code, I can just run it. And if I go to my browser, well, we know what this looks like. This is the code we had from before doing server push event. We actually don't want to use that code because we're not doing server push event. I just need somewhere to start. So go templates, that's what we're using. And for now, because I said we're not doing server push event, well, I'm going to remove a lot of stuff that has to do with server push event. So I don't care about all this client code and updating the dashboard. I certainly don't need all of this. We're simply left with something that could serve up HTML pages or static pages rather. On the client side, in terms of HTML, well, I'll reduce a lot of the code that we have. For example, I don't need the canvas and I do not need to import the JavaScript library. I'm not doing that. Um, you know what? Okay, we can leave that. Oh, okay, what else I don't need? Oh, in JavaScript, well, I don't need all of this that I have to do with fetching events. And so now let me rerun my code and refresh. Okay, so this doesn't change. So, okay, what, I still want some dynamic data. Right now, if I click on users, it says page not phone. Or I click on books, it says page not phone. So let's fix that. First thing I like to do, however, is make it so that it's obvious that we are on the what page we're on. So I'll change that. And now if I'm on the home page, it's bold. And when I get a user page, I want that to be bold when I'm on that page. So do we get a user page? Well, here's the hint. It should be in a folder called user. At least that's where it's looking. We can have it look somewhere else by changing this value that it looks for. We can say just user.html and create a user.html page here, but I'll put it in the subdirectory user. And let me copy this file. But like I said before, I want this page to say So let's see if this works. Refresh. Okay, so user page loads. It tells me it's user. If I click home, I get home. User. Okay. There's something wrong, however. And for us to see what it is, look at what happened when I click on home. It seems like my CSS is, you know, taking effect and I can read it and it's laying out my page nicely. But when I click on users, the CSS is not being loaded. So let's take a look and see why that is. If I go to tools here in Chrome, but for each browser, it might be different. But anyway, I'm looking for network because I want to see when it tries to fetch the user's page, what has happened. Notice what I get. I get 400 for this page not found, 404 page not found. Whereas when I do it for home, as you can see, it can fetch the page. Notice which directory is looking for this. So I can fix that by saying my CSS is in the roots folder. Well, now I need to refresh, reload my page. And let's see, why is that? Oh, I changed the wrong one, but it works okay for our own page. Yep, change the wrong file. Let me take out some of this from my user page. And so I'm on the home page. I click on the user page and notice no, everything is fine because no, I can load my CSS file. So I have to change the path where it's loading CSS from. Okay, so that looks good. Maybe I should fix the home page while we're at it. 
um, book sorry books page. I should fix the books page also so let me fix the books page while we're at it and we should expect this to work also and it does okay so so far I haven't done anything about templating so what are templates like I said templates are a way for you to combine static text with data to create dynamic text if you look at an example in the golang documentation we have a structure so this is our data material is a string count is a number and of course we create an item we initialize it so that's clear and now we want a new template with some name don't worry about the name for now and in creating this template we want to parse it from string so the string we're going to parse has these angle brackets and they call them mouth stash or handle bracket in some places and within is an expression in this case the dot refers to as you can clearly see count so the reason why you don't have to specify the variable in front of it is because in gold length template they have this idea of a cursor the idea of the cursor is that it is set to dot and it's pointing to something and by default, it's pointing to the initial data structure you pass in. And you'll see that in a minute. So if you imagine that, oh, at first it's pointing to this variable sweater, then if we say dot count, it means the count field of this variable sweater. And the same thing here, that material is the material field of this variable sweater. And so once you parse this string, this is the piece of string that I say is the template, is the static piece of string with some parts of it that should be replaced these are the dynamic parts although anything outside the angle bracket will remain the same and so ignore the error for now to check for an error but now once you have a template you can say execute that template and by executing i need two pieces of information i need where to write it to so you need a io writer and in this case you write it to standard out and we need the variable to combine with this template. So remember, you already parsed the template. So now when you pass the variable, it looks at a variable as dot. And now when you say dot count, it knows where to get that value. And now it's substituted. And the output should read, in this case, count 17 items are made of wool. That should be the output. So we can try this and see what we get. So let me close everything and sort of start with main that go here. And for now, I'll move this up here. And so, all right, let's reduce the space a little bit. Okay, so similarly, we should expect to see 17 items are made of wool. So let's Close this and restart it. And there we go. Sentient items are made of wool. So pretty straightforward. So you may be thinking, okay, what does that have to do with what we're doing over here? What does that have to do with our application? Well, maybe when we change, go to the users of book page, we like to see how many books there are and maybe a listing of books. And so being able to fetch a page with new data. So notice the difference. With Ajax, we just fetching a subset of data. With server push events, we were fetching a subset of data, just like in the AJS case. One is pull versus sort of push. And now I'm suggesting that another way we can do thing is fetch a new page with updated data. So when we go here and say, I want books or user page, we expect it to be populated with some new information. So let's do that. And we can use go template to get that result because if we change this instead, if I move this piece of code into a function, let's call it some handler, books and handler. So what I've done is register a books handler, and now we should expect 
if we change this to write to this writer instead of standard out, we should expect when we call our books handler, we should get this back instead of our current HTML page because this is going to be called, this handler should be called before our, let's go back, this handler books should be called before this handler and therefore we wouldn't have the opportunity to read this index.html page but instead this gets returned. So let's see if that's the case. Of course we have to stop this and rerun it. Oh, okay, and we have Oh, because I did not import OS package. I'm using the OS package. I'm no longer using OS package, so I need to get rid of that, not import it. And so there we go. We're running. And let's refresh. And there we go. Sentient items are made of wool. So automatically, we see we can use this on our web application. So what I'll do, since this, even though this client is dynamic code, I'll move it to our server directory. So simply drag this di books directory, move it to our server directory. And what I want to do is change this to read the text from HTML, this index at HTML. Instead of calling it index at HTML though, maybe you might want to call it TMPL or something to sort of imply that's a template and not the full thing yet. So for now, I'll get rid of, well, let's see, we can go back and read all the methods that are available. Didn't really mean to do that. But one of the, the first thing you realize is once you start reading this, the thing that you want to use is not text template, but rather HTML template for security reason. So I advise you to go read first the temp text template documentation, this overview that tells you what you can put in these handle brackets, actions, pipelines, the if statement range and so on, which we will use. We'll come back to that. But you can definitely go ahead and read that. But one of the things that you'll see in the documentation is that you have a template, template parse files. And so this is the one we're going to use, template parse files, which return a template. There's also a nice function called template must, which if you look, takes two parameters, which are the same two parameters you return from parse file. And therefore you can use this. So let's just do it. Let me just show you what I mean. So here I'll say template parse file. Well, actually template must compile, template must. And if I want to par parse is server slash books slash index.html. And since I'm calling must parse, must parse is a wrapper function to do exactly what I was doing, which was to test the error and panic if this template doesn't come back because we're saying it must comply. So I do not need this anymore. Oh, except yes, I can use this to test if I was successfully, if I was able to execute the template. So there we go. That's a new variable. And if this is correct, then I should be able to see the exact same result I had before except now I don't have any handle bracket or anything in my index.html file. So I shouldn't see any dynamic data being substituted, but it should at least work. It should return all the code that we had before. Of course, I have to stop this and recompile. Okay, this is the go code change. So there we go. So we are able to see the code from Go. Now Go is actually reading a template and sending it to our browser. We don't know that for sure yet because we removed our template code. So let's put that back. So let's say, for example, here I wanted to print the number of books. So here I'm using the length function, which I said, you can go to the documentation and you can see all the different functions you can call. And so here they are. And so here's linked. And then it tells you how you call a, fun a function. So method space or function space for argument. And so that's what I'm doing here. Call the linked function and I'm passing it the books list and field of the object or the variable I'll pass to this template. 
So if you remember, we have this sweater variable. It does not have a books listing field, but I'll add a books listing field. I'll change this from inventory to books. Well, actually, no. I generally actually just call it mine page. This is how I've been using it. And so I can say on a page or for that page, for example, or the books page, what do I want to show? I want to show a list of books. So books listing and it's a slice of books. Now I still need a books field. And what do we want for books? Well, it seems like order, ISBN number, those sort of things make sense. So now my books page, this object, the structure that will represent all the information I want to send to my books page. Well, it's just a struct of book listing and we have a book or rather a slice of book. Book listing is a slice of books, so a set of books and books can have all these fields and of course our currency and we'll, since currency is a type, we can have a nice method for printing out currency value. Of course, this is no longer valid. And I need to correct my template. This is uppercase because the reason why is if you imagine we pass a struct object using Go's rule of what is exported and what's not exported, we know that if we use lowercase for our struct, only members of the package where that structure is defined can access it. Well, the template reader that we get from the Golang library is not part of the main package, so it wouldn't be able to access that field. So we have to make that an uppercase. So hence why all our fields from this object needs to be uppercase. Let me add a method to our currency value for printing out as a string. So this is pretty straightforward and simple, so I wouldn't spend too much time explaining it. I assume you know about methods in Go and how to attach them to a type of the receiver. So let's move on. And so now I need to initialize my variable here, which again is a slice of books. If we stop here and rerun our program, then we go to our application and refresh, we should see two books. And that's exactly what we see. Well, that's fine. That's pretty simple. But how about if we wanted to see our books listed in a table? So let's go modify our template now to generate a table listing those books. So I'm gonna, I will speed type that a little bit. So here we go. Okay, so this is sort of what we want. Uh, let's go back here, do refresh. And well, I don't like the pattern, so let's change the pattern. It's actually border, just one border should do it, but let's see if that, if we need padding. Okay, so, okay, so that's a lot better. Yeah, we can do some pattern to push things out a little. But this is sort of what we want, but we don't want to hard code the values instead. That's why we're using templates. So when we 
read this from the server, the server would update the page, generate it on the server side, and then send us the entire page with the data already updated. So we definitely want to do some sort of looping here. That's where the range function comes in. And as you can see, it's just range over some pipeline, which is some value. So the value of the pipeline will be an array, slice, or map per channel. So in our case, this is a slice. So we want to iterate over this slice, spit out some sort of template, and of course we have to use end. So let's go right there. So it looks like what we want to repeat is actually this part. We want to repeat the rows. So let's wrap that. That's our template. Let's wrap that in a range. And the pipeline we're interested in is this very same pipeline. Actually, that's the only one we have. So, and of course, this is our template that we put between our range and end. So now we can repeat this multiple times. Now, if we just run this, we should see that we have two lines of the exact same text. And there you go, because we have repeated or looped over this slice. Of course, we need we want to change this. So like I said, in GoLang template, each time it refers to an object, it updates the dot or the cursor to be the dot to that thing. So as range ranges over our slice, when it gets to a book object, that now is updated within this template to refer to that book. Whereas here, the dot referred to our variable. Within this range, a dot referred to a book. So since we're referring to a book, we can simply type Remember, these are the fields for a book object, and so we're not iterating over book object. So let's see if this works. Oh, we have to stop our program and compile. Run it again. And let's rerun. Oh, okay. There's an error. So online. So let's see, where is that error? So this does not appear to be in our code. Oh, line 48. What's on line 48? Okay, so problem executing our template. Let's see where that error is. Huh, doesn't quite say exactly what the error is. Um, hmm. Let me do FMT print on this error, see if we can see it that way. Oh, well, not FMT print, but I'll plug it as fatal and see if that actually tells us why our template is giving us a problem. Can't evaluate field pub date. Ah, can't evaluate pub date. So that panic did not show us a error that we can use. So pub date. Ah, that's because pub date is not accessible. All right. So let's start this over and rerun. And there we go. So we have our data that we have in our application. So you can imagine. If you write in this, each time this handler is called, you'd probably hit a database and look for some updated values from your data source, and now you can update the template with it. We can stop here. Um, we've demonstrated how to use data to drive a template so you can create even you can create dynamic text. And in this case, it was dynamic HTML that we sent to a web browser. The other thing we can do is sort of have some more realistic looking data. So if you want, you can really stop here. Uh, what I'm going to do now is not really write any more code, well, a little bit more code. Instead, let's say I want to, I move this into a 
json document so if i use move this into a json document And this is an array of books. All right. So something like that. All right. OK. So if this is my JSON document, then uh, I can read this from our Golang program by saying, I want to populate this books array with a return value which is a slice of books from a function. So let's call it load books. And we want to load books from some, from some file called books.json. Of course, I need to write this function. File name to the string, and it returns slice of books. First thing we are going to have is the books that we want to return. Okay, so if we run our code right now, since we return an empty slice of book, we should expect a table that is empty. So let's run that, make sure at least this works. Refresh and zero books. So that works great. We did this already in one of our exercises here, decoding JSON from file. So that's fairly easy. And so we try to read the open this file. If we can't open it, we log the error as fatal. If we can, if we can open the file, we want to defer closing the file. We use that to create our JSON decoder. And of course, we want to decode the book. So and then we return books. Actually, oh, so we want books. So we want books. But if we look at our JSON, we have this field books listing. Actually, that's not what we want. We just want a slice of books. That's it. So we don't actually want books listed. We just want a slice of books. So that's it. All right. So let's control C, run our program again. And there we go. Our one book from our JSON file. Well, if we have that, then we can always go get some more data and easily have a much longer list. So go to Macaroo. Use movie title instead of title. Book movie titles will look like book title, so that's okay. And we want ISBN. Okay. And let's preview this data. And that sort of look like what we want. Five fills look sort of like that. That looks good enough. And let's a thousand is a little bit much, so maybe a hundred, maybe fifty. But either way. We can now download this in that comma separated value. We know to do that too, but JSON, since we've already written that code, so we download it. And it's going to save as mock data. Go back here and Overwrite our existing data. And if I rerun our code, I don't have to change anything. It should now just list that. So our data could change 
And again, we've externalized our data. This could be in a server, a database server, whatever. But we've externalized our data and notice, oh, we didn't have to change our code. We, we have also externalized our template so we can change our template without changing our code. And so that is how you use Golang template. Very easy, I think, very straightforward. And now you can see how you can start putting together a web application using the three things we sort of learned already, which is how to create dynamic pages, which is where we just create a dynamic page, how to create dynamic sections of your page using either server push events or Ajax. And combining those three, you can start to think of ways of creating really cool applications. Now, of course, their application look a little bit ugly. If you're worried about that, consider using something like um, React, Vue.js, Angular, or even Bootstrap to help give your application a much better look and feel. So, but that's all about just look and feel, but the meat and potatoes, really important thing is what we have done so far. Okay, take care, thanks, see you. Follow me on Twitter. I'll post the link to Twitter and Instagram. I'll put the link up. And of course, thumbs up the video and subscribe. Appreciate your time, patience. Take care. See you in the next video. Bye.